it's quite a, uh, an honor to be here. Like uh, Jeremy said, and thanks for, for having me. I, uh, I was here in the 90s, which was like 10 years ago, right? It wasn't, <laughs> wasn't very long ago. That's what I keep telling myself, because it's, it's like it can't be 30 years ago. That's just crazy. Um, what, I, what I want you to get out of this today is I'm going to kind of tell you a little bit more about what I do now, and then we're going to go back, and I'm just going to take you through all the kind of the steps of, of uh, how I got to where I am now. Um, a lot of it, I have no idea. You know, how, I could have never planned almost all of the things I'm going to tell you about. So, um, if there are three things I want you to take away, is that it's a journey, right? Um, just like one semester is a journey, but your whole life and your career and all that is going to be a journey. I, I was in all of your seats. Right? Except this wasn't built when I was here. That was in, it would have been in the, what we used to call the recital hall, which is now the concert hall. Um, but I was, I was all of you. So uh, will you be doing what I'm doing? It's, it's quite a niche, but there are millions of other niches that you could end up in. So that's kind of what I want you to get out of. It's a journey. Um, I kind of thought about this too as I was preparing this, is that life's like a piece of music. I don't know if somebody's ever said, somebody had to have said it. If they did, I'm just going to borrow it for today. But, I mean, endless numbers of styles and, and whatever of music, and some may have major parts, some may have minor, different rhythms, different phrasing, right? Life's going to be like that. And your life and your life are going to be two different pieces of music, right? So, uh, it really, it, it does kind of come down to that. It's, it's, it's a lot like music. Um, and probably the most important thing you can take away from me today, because this is how I am, where I am now, which I would consider successful. Um, some people want to, to win a Grammy to be successful. Some people, whatever. I have a, a wonderful family and, and a solid job, and I get to kind of schedule my own time and do whatever I want. And, and a nice house. house. And, and a nice house, and that's... But it, it's nothing crazy. It, it, it's, it's nice, and so, so I'm thankful. Um, but it's all what you put into it. I, I have to say, everything that I have now or am now, uh, not just belongings, but is, is because of what I put into it. Now, there's you. some people are... are going to put, put in um, artistically, maybe that's your, well, then put it in, right? But you got to do it, right? You also have to learn the financials and all kinds of that kind of, quote, boring stuff too, um, which we'll get to. So I want you to take away those three things, but especially that it's all what you put into it. Um, now, Sarah back here had, had uh, the, I guess, I had the pleasure of having her to my studio, so she got to see a little bit more. So I asked Ask Sarah if you if you ever have any like, well, what was this really like? Plus, I'm going to open it up to all of you to. My cards are up here, but give me an email, give me a call, and, and maybe we can just find a time where we can get a group of you together to come see the studio. So, what do I do now? I run Mixing Room Studios with my partner Kurt Lobbins. We've been uh, in existence for 13 years now, and we pretty much don't do any music recording. And that's kind of by choice. Again, I'm a professional musician as well. Um, we just don't. Our, our business is ad agencies. And it will, I'll back up and tell you how I got there, but it's pretty much ad agencies, voiceovers, things like that. When we started 13 years ago, which we'll get to that, how, um, we, we, weren't, we were doing voiceovers, but voice talent were with, ad, were with uh, talent agencies. Over that 13 years now, voice talent, we have a voice talent roster of hundreds of voice talent all over the country because of technology. They can have their home studios, whatever. Um, and that's a big part of uh, last year alone, we paid voice talent 260 some thousand dollars. So, so, you know, for anything from Nebraska furniture market commercials to uh, you name it, um, anime stuff or whatever. So, I mean, all kinds of different things that, that people find our voice talent in now. It's, it's gotten quite a, quite a rep for, for having a great voice talent. So, we work with ad agencies. Again, Nebraska Furniture Mart, I was going to show you, but we couldn't get the technology. And the technology thing, we couldn't get the technology. Either. Just check out MixingRoomStudios.com. I mean, mix, uh, uh, Nebraska Furniture Mart is one of our biggest clients of, uh, you know, kind of the, the regular. They're in three or four times a week doing um, 
there's a couple of different voice talent that they use, a male and a female, and they right now use a, a standard music bed, and so that's pretty much just over and over and over. They have their, their people that write the scripts, they come in, um, but then, uh, then there's tons and tons of, of projects that you've never even uh, imagined were out there for uh, um, corporation, for business to business kind of stuff, selling uh, corn feed or, or whatever. I mean, it just goes tons and all kinds of things that, that are, are, are really diverse. Uh, but somebody's got to do it, right? So, political season, when political season, we do a lot of political, a lot of the, that crap that's on, right? That, uh, whether whatever side you're on, it's, it's all just kind of. But somebody's got to do it, right? So we supply the voice talent and, and do all the sound design for it. There's some commercials, Nebraska Furniture Mart, pretty basic. Voiceover, music bed, pretty basic, right? Um, but there's some that has a ton of sound design, sound effects, uh, whatever. Whether it's natural sounds or just having setting the scene of, of birds and uh, an outdoor scene you know, or a door shutting. So it, it's really <coughs> um, so that's my that's my full time gig, right? Now that's my that's my essentially eight to five. I try to be done at three o'clock now. I'm lucky enough to be able to do that. Schedule my time and start uh, around eight and zoom, but um, eight to three is about my 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 time. Um, my side gig or side hustle is my music business, which. A lot of you could eventually someday do. You could not. The, the, a lot of the musicians I work with and I contract are veterinarians, uh, audiologists, uh, and everything in between. Teacher, music teachers, regular teachers, uh, you name it. So you can, if you're going, if you're a musician, how, I, I assume everybody plays in here, right? Or yeah, uh, pretty much. Even though you're, if you're tech majors, you may um, not play as much, but. Same thing with tech. I have uh, a friend, Doyle Tipler, who's also an alum, came, was here at the same time. He does recording of his house, and he records like bands and things like that. Has a, his whole basement is set up. So that's his side hustle. He works for Cargill, and, and that's his, you know, his part-time deal. So those are my two, Extra Space Music and Mixing Room. With Extra Space Music, I'm not just a musician. Um, I've, over all this time, go back in just a second and talk about how I got here. But my primary thing now is contracting. Like Jeremy said, I when the Eagles come through town and they need a 45-piece orchestra, they call me and I am, am thankful to have gotten to know people like Jeremy and all these wonderful symphony musicians or, or commercial musicians. And I have to put them all together and, and create a great product for for whether it's the Eagles or the Broadway shows that come through. Now that's changed, as, as a lot has changed with COVID. Um, next season, there's only one Broadway show coming through, unfortunately, that we, needs local musicians. All the rest are self-contained, which is great. Still musicians are working. Uh, it's still live musicians. They're just touring with the, with the, the Broadway shows. So uh, only one show will be local, but that's all right. It comes from somewhere else. Uh, and then I also run the Omaha Big Band, a solid brass quartet, um, and extra space jazz. So the big band, there's a 10-piece version of the big band that plays weddings, things like that. The, the brass quartet plays a lot of services or, or weddings. Um, that's not as much now uh, as, it, as it was. Okay, so that's enough about what I do now. I think the more interesting part for you all is going to be, how did I get there? So let's go back to... Um, High school. Who can guess what year I graduated high school? Anybody have a guess? 86. 86. I don't like this guy. I used to like him. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. 1991. I went to I went to Burke High School. I moved from I actually moved from Western Nebraska. I grew up in Gary and, and moved and went to went to Burke High School for for my whole high school. Um, I was in band then, fine, average player. Um, never did all state or anything like that. My band director really didn't push it for us. So, you know, I wasn't like super amazing great or anything. It was good. Um, and I was going to go to college to, I decided pre-med. My, my, uh, my mom was a nurse 
And I thought, yeah, I think uh, I was around doctors and things my, my whole life. And so pre-med was going to be my thing. But what I thought was, okay, I'm going to do music as a major because you still have to take all the pre-med stuff, right? All the science and all that. But you actually have to have a major when you're, when you're doing it. So I thought I'm going to do music. And I did. So I got all my pre-med stuff done ultimately and all my music stuff done. And as, I, as that went along and I started getting some gigs and, and things like that, I realized, you know what? Do a doctor is not what I want to be. I don't want to do that. So I got it all done. <laughs> But I didn't. I uh, ended up getting my music education degree, is, is what my, my bachelor's was in. And I graduated in 96, so none of this was here. This was all a big, uh, I think all of you probably know no difference, but this was all just a uh, lawn, right? Uh, there was still a football team, and I played the marching band. Uh, march for the football team, let's see. The other kind of crazy teams were, were different. Lots of things, but um, my four years was. Or, or five years, it was actually four and a half. Um, I took one semester off, and I went on a Broadway tour, actually, with, with Pitt Orchestra for a touring Broadway show. And, uh, and then came back and, and finished my degree. So, um, but one of the big, I told you there were, there were different uh, pivotal moments in my life, and this was a big one. So when I first got here as a freshman, again, I told you I wasn't, I was kind of mediocre or whatever, but I thought I was a pretty good trombone player anyway went to the wind ensemble tryouts and didn't even make the wind ensemble. And I was like, what in the hell? You gotta be kidding me. I didn't even make it. <laughs> but little, I don't even want to be first chair or that, but I didn't even make the wind ensemble, right? So I started practicing like crazy. Again, it's, it's something that I did and I decided that I was gonna put into it. Right? I started practicing like crazy again. My thing, I found my, my time that I would, was at night and I practiced in the stairways. And, and I don't, I'm not telling you to go do that because you might get in trouble. I don't know, but I just did and, and it was, I like practicing in the stairways. Um, and it wasn't too long. I, I mean, you don't have to practice too long. When you're practicing every day for a few hours or whatever it is, pretty soon you start getting pretty good just because you're, you're practicing, right? So that whole year went by or whatever. Well, by that next year, then I made it. I was actually playing, I think I probably was playing lead in the jazz band even by my sophomore year then. Um, so that was a big pivotal moment, right? And then I actually started, I can't even remember exactly, but I, I started getting, getting some gigs. Um, my, my trombone professor was Jay Wise, and he's still here doing things, right? And doing, he does the, the music uh, business class and, and trombone too, so. And he was my trombone professor. Um, he didn't really like push me, push me, but when he knew that I was stepping in, he okay, you're you're ready, then let's let's go. And then I would get gigs from him. You know, you'll I can't recommend enough. Use your professors here. They have they're playing gigs. They have links to the community, and so they'll notice that you're doing something now. Let me have you sub for them or whatever. I think that's probably what I did. Is that maybe I sub for him at the Omaha Community Playhouse, which was another um, pivotal moment. So I started getting these gigs, just slowly but surely, and then I, I took everything. That's quite a bit different than now, but then I would take everything. It didn't matter what it was. Uh, I, I don't remember when exactly this was, but another big part was joining the Omaha Musicians Association. As someone your age, a, a young 20s or whatever it might be, even, even if uh, Teenage. There's there's discounts. I think it's even half maybe for a little while. I don't know what it is. But that was a big part. Just just making connections and and meeting people, other contractors at, at that time. So I started getting gigs. Um, a big huge gig of my life was the Confidentials. You may not have heard of that band, but it was a big 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 uh, wedding band. Um, played celebration and all you know all that kind of stuff. Right? But it was every weekend we were playing these big high dollar weddings. Eventually. Now I met the guy who was the leader of that band through some other stuff. Um, again, around that time. And I was the one that said, because I was loving horn section stuff. I was starting to write horn arrangements and, and trying to make my own band and whatever. Well, I met him and said, 
why don't you, why don't we, you have a horn section, you have a, a sax player. They were kind of a ska band and then started with, starting to do weddings, getting into more of the weddings. So he said, you know what, Chris, yeah, okay. let's, let's do it, let's do it. Let you, we're doing these tunes, and okay, great, I had some of them, and so I made it happen, right? Um, Thirteen years later, and I mean thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, because we were making it, uh, let's see, I probably ended with the confidentials, um, it was 13 years, so maybe the uh, mid-2000s, I guess, but for 13 years, I was probably making a few hundred dollars a gig, um, this is back in the 90s, and that's, I mean, that's pretty decent good now, right? So that was a good gig. Um, then I told you about the Omaha Community Playhouse. That was also a huge part of my, I wouldn't be here actually today if, if it weren't for the Playhouse because of just, you just never know what, what moment or what you're doing um, today. You know, maybe some, something will happen from this thing that we're doing right now for some of you. Maybe most of you, nothing. But you just never know, right? So the Omaha Community Playhouse, I was playing shows down in the pit, Music Man, and you know, all, all those whatever. So you're down in the pit, nobody can see you, you're playing your thing, making a few bucks, fine. Um, after who knows how long, I was just about ready to be done doing that, because all the shows seemed to be like they were in the spring or fall, when it's beautiful outside and I was stuck downstairs and in a, in a dark pit. And I was starting to get to that point in my life where I got a job, which I'll get to, um, I don't really need to do this, so I was just starting to thinking I was gonna. And then a show called Buddy came to the, the playoffs, and everybody know who Buddy Holly is, kind of maybe. You at least heard of him, Buddy Holly from the fifties, right? Peggy Sue and those kind of stuff. So there was a show about Buddy Holly. Fine, played that fun show, but I met a guy named Billy McGuigan, and this kind of goes. This kind of goes two two parts. This this show was a huge part of my life. Uh, I, I wouldn't be doing anything. I wouldn't be here probably telling you about my my uh, my two businesses if it weren't for that show. So Billy McGuigan was the guy that did the play buddy. Um, but then there were also other people, and that that just that whole show started. Everybody hung out afterwards and in the parking lot talking, just hanging. It was just a great vibe from that show. So then I also met somebody that were, she was uh, she was in the like the chorus and whatever. But she, one of her best friends, dad, owned a company called Editech, and it was an audio and video post production place. Right? And at that time, there was walls and walls of, of video equipment because uh, the full wave standard F still, but you had used to have to have those that, that walls and walls of equipment. Well. It just happened that they were losing their audio engineer, um, and actually, I need to back up just a just a second before. Well, let me finish that, and I'll tell you how I how I started getting into the recording thing. So they happened to be needing an audio engineer because their guy Kurt Lobbins, does that name sound familiar? My partner now, right? He was leaving there to go with somebody else who was, uh, Johnny Ray Gomez had a jing he was pretty much doing jingles, and Kurt was gonna do the, the ad agency stuff. So Kurt left, and they knew that I was doing recording, I'll get to that in just a second, uh, through this Buddy Holly connection, this show, and so she said, well, why don't you interview with my dad, and, and you, you, know, you never know. Well, I did, and I got the, I got the job, and then we'll go to the next part. But how did I get to uh, recording? Um, and then we'll also talk about the Billy McGuigan connection. But now we're going to the, the recording side, right? So when I was here, I did my, got through my bachelor's, right? Um, and some of this kind of overlaps. But essentially when I was done, we'll call it when I started my, my grad assistant job, right? I don't think I was doing too much in my undergrad recording-wise. But it started out being recording recitals. It, the recitals needed recorded, and there was a stereo mic hanging up in the hall, and over the, the quote recording studio was that room that's between, is it still called 105 and 109? I assume they're the same numbers, right? There's that room up above. That was the, the recording studio, so it was wired from, the, from now the concert hall. It was wired in there, and it was just a stereo mic to record recitals. 
or, or um, choir concerts or women's song concerts, whatever. They need somebody to record those. So I started recording those on DAT, digital audio tape, right? And then I had to give a, a cassette. <laughs> to, two, I had to make two cassettes because they put one like in archives or whatever over in the library. I don't know if they're still there. And then one went to the person whose recital it was. So I was just doing that kind of quote boring stuff, right? But I really wanted to, I started having an interest in, in recording. So I started learning how microphones worked and all this kind of stuff. Well, fast forward, they kept, there was a, a friend of mine, John Tim, who was, was going here as well. He had an interest in that too. So he and I both learned and learned and learned. Well, another pivotal moment in our lives, it just so happened that digital audio workstations were starting to be a thing, all right? And he was a Windows guy, so we, we found this program called Saw Pro, S-A-W Pro. And we essentially started learning how DAWs worked. And we were, again, we had to be one of the first people to, to learn these things. And it was on Windows, so it was just, we were always fixing the computer more than we were ever recording, it seemed like. But we started learning multi-track recording, and then started our own business as educators. Um, so keep in mind that now I, had, I had got my music education degree. You follow this kind of along, right? Um, I got my music education degree, and so I was familiar with teachers and band programs and things like that. And I was over at my dad's house one time, and I, he had an album of his band from Scott's Bluff, his concert band from 1960, whatever it would have been. And they had an album that they made, and I was like, dang, nobody does that anymore. So John, John, Tim, and I made this business where we would go to schools, and we called it fun. We basically set it up as a fundraiser. So, um, We'd go to schools and provide them with CDs for 10 bucks a piece. They had to buy 200 of them, so 2,000 bucks, right? Um, and then they could sell them for more. And we had somebody that did the graphic art. We must have done hundreds of them because we started making connections with teachers, going to the state band masters, you know, convention and things like that. Um, and had this little business that was making going to two schools to their either in their hall or their even their band room. We put reverb on it and whatever. And, We'd multi-track so that if there was, they needed more tubas or whatever, we could do that and change it later. So we started there. And then we started um, multi-tracking bands. Um, some of my professors, one, Steve Rabine was the jazz uh, director. He's passed away now. Uh, but started recording a lot of his stuff. And we were just learning how multi-track stuff worked. And we went to some conventions and things like that. But I just, I did it myself. Remember that, that kind of a theme? That I was doing it myself. And, and, and learning that stuff myself. So I got the, the call to do edit tech. Well, I had never recorded voiceovers and taken breaths out. How many, how many of you have done all that kind of stuff? Have you music tech? <laughs> have you had to take breaths out? Well, now I don't even have to listen. I can see them and I can pretty much edit it. But, right? I, I've never done any of that. Well, I figured I know how EQ and stuff work. I know how compression works on this and that. They were on some software that I didn't even know. I knew Pro Tools, and that's what I still use. They were on some program I didn't even know. Uh, but, I mean, okay, where's the record button? All right, I found where the record button was. <laughs> Whatever, you just, you just learn it, and I did. So, then I was at Editech for seven years. Now let's back up to the other wing of the Playhouse, that Playhouse show, uh, and meeting Billy McGuigan. Well, I'm an entrepreneur. That's another thing you're gonna get from today. Maybe a lot of you also have that in you to, to be your own boss and, and make your own business. Maybe none of you do. I, um, but that's what I'm going to share is, is that that's, that's what I do. I'm not afraid of it. I failed. I'll tell you about that a little bit. But thankfully, most of the time, it's been successful. Well, I met Billy McGuigan, and we're like, God, this thing is like nuts. People love this thing. Why don't we just create our own show? Um, we could even build a, a place that would just do tribute shows. You know, we were thinking, we were even thinking that. He said, well, yeah. So we, we wrote the show, I did the music part, he, he wrote the, 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 theme, the theme of the show, which essentially was Buddy Holly coming back from the dead, was kind of the theme then. Uh, but then he said, you know what, I know a, uh, a lady at the Funny Bone, Colleen Quinn, and I know her, let's talk to her. Well, she convinced us to just do it there at the Funny Bone. 
So we did, and it was really successful. Ultimately, it started touring, and now things are overlapping. Right, I was doing Editech, and but and Rave On, our show called Rave On, was was touring and, and making some good money too. And then uh, I got married, right? So that still works. You can still tour and and, and be married um, and kind of have a job. So. But that was kind of like, yeah, man, there's a, <laughs> there's a lot going on. Well, I guess thankfully, Editech, the owner, was getting ready to retire. He had all this standard deaf video stuff. A beautiful facility. Got the audio studio there, too, was beautiful. Um, but he was just getting ready to basically retire. So it was like, okay, am I going to just go this, this way and do these shows and, and do this? touring thing and, and put everything there, uh, maybe record on the side, and like out of the blue, Kurt, my partner now, calls me, emails me, whatever it was, and said, you know, I don't know what you're thinking about doing. He didn't own the company where he was, was after he had left Editech. I don't know, you know what you're thinking or whatever, but I, I thought about opening a place. Would you be um, interested in kind of joining forces? And we met. And sure enough, we did, and it, it's, it's been great. So we took basically, thankfully, we have our existing clients. I didn't own Editech, but he was okay. I approached Skip. He was okay because he wasn't, I wasn't stealing clients from him. He was going to be retiring. And Kurt had his own clients already, and thankfully, they followed us. So we built, and the mixing, like literal, literally and figuratively, we built the mixing room. Now we call it mixing room studios, but the mixing room. And we wanted two identical suites. So here's where we kind of get into the fun, some of the fun technical stuff. We wanted two identical suites because it's like 99% of, uh, of studios have a big, big studio and then maybe some smaller A, B, or tracking rooms or whatever it was. And we didn't want to, we didn't want them. We wanted, we were bringing both of ours together. We wanted them to be identical. So we, we found Wes Lachow, he's who designed our, our space, he did uh, Doug Van Sloan. Any of you know Doug Van Sloan from Focus Mastering? He's, he's here, he's a world class mastering engineer, he's here in a mall. Wes did his place and his new place which is at his house too. And so that's how we found Wes. And Wes does studios all over the world. Uh, they're on Mix Magazine cover and whatever, so he like, really knows what he's doing. So he, we, we found a place, and, and he did the three models and everything, uh, jumping, jumping ahead. But we, we built the mixing room. We're 120th in Londo, Maple-ish. That's, that's where we are, it's back in there. Um, the, the rooms are, are awesome. They're, we have two track. Remember, we do voiceover, so we don't have really enough room for, for uh, I mean, the tracking room's probably uh, a little bigger than, than the piano, maybe, right? Where and a little bit, but almost almost that shape, the, the tracking. So probably twice that big, but not not big enough to have a, a full band. That's just not what we do. Um, but there's there's that wing, right? Of, of the, it's crazy just how thing, things go. Uh, I was also building manager for this when I was doing my my grad assistant and doing the recording stuff. Um, which kind of worked and kind of didn't because I, I was out recording and somebody needed something. So, but I did. I was a building manager here for a while. Um, okay, so then we get to uh, the mixing rooms going. That's started. So my kid was one year, one year old then when we were drywalling there, and he's 14 now. My oldest, so yeah, 13 years ago. Um, and then it gets a little more difficult to own your own business, be married, and have a kid. Um, yeah, that was, that was a, little, a little too much. So I sold my part of Rayvon, which worked great, not for any millions of dollars, but I made a little bit because we were co-owners of it. So um, I sold that business. And Billy and I are still great friends. He's actually a voice talent on our, on our roster, so I see him. But I don't have anything to do with he does Rayvon and yesterday and today. He's still very successful doing those. But then I focused everything on, on mixing. Um, 
one more little part of, of what I did, and then I want to open it up for some questions and, and fill it out. But I, I told you I did fail, and, and one of those, uh, or I think it's probably the only business-wise that I, I failed, was a bar. I thought, oh, this was, this was like brand new, like halfway, so maybe seven, seven, eight years ago, seven years ago or something like that. Um, it was called the Lauderton, and the, the idea was to have craft brews and craft cocktails, but then we had to like unplug the music closely. So it was a great concept. Weekends were busy, weekdays not, and not enough money in, too much out, right? Didn't work. So I probably lost mm, $75,000 doing that, so ouch, right? But mixing room, mixing room has been awesome. Um, that, that almost offset, my, that basically, selling Raymond, losing the water time, they kind of, they kind of, uh, I won't tell you how much I sold, but they kind of even out. So, you know, you win some, you win some. <coughs> um, and now I think I told you that, that uh, contracting is the biggest thing I do uh, music wise. So I take great pride in that, but both with the voiceovers and um, contracting musicians. Because we played last year, I think, I, I don't remember if I just told you or if I told you all that I paid. We paid like 260 some thousand to voiceover talents, and I paid 130,000 to musicians last year. So whether it was Broadway shows or the Eagles or whatever, you know. Um, so that's I take great pride in that I I get to share my uh, my uh, my strengths and 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 help employ musicians too. So okay, so I've been talking a ton. Hopefully, some of you have uh, questions. Or thoughts. Any wise words, words of wisdom you can tell me? Because <laughs> I'm always trying to learn. Come on. Oh, yeah. There it is. So the identical tracking rings, is that so you can, like, are you recording like two people for the same show in two different places? That's a great question. So, yes, we can. We, um, we have two tracking rooms that are separated by a window. That's basically how we wanted it. So that, but we hardly ever open that that screen up, that window, um, or the, the screen to see through. But you could have two voice talents in whatever. Or you, if you were recording music, yeah, you could just separate them. But the way they're uh, normal in the patch bay and everything is that one goes to that studio and this one goes to this studio. But they're just meters. Yeah? I was looking on your guys' website and I seen how they work for cars. That's some of the cool work that we get to do. Yeah, so he, he said um, he saw that we do work for cars. Larry the Cable Guy has become a, actually a great friend of mine through Colleen Quinn that I told you about at the Funny Bone, right? It's, it's just so crazy how things are. I don't know if your lives will be this crazy and so intertwined. Probably will. Um, they probably will. One way, even if you're, quote, just going, my wife's a music teacher, but you, maybe you think you're, just, you're gonna go and be a music teacher. Well, it's still gonna take twists and turns, right? So uh, maybe you're not gonna be self-employed. Yes, yeah, so we record all of Larry the Cable Guy for cars, for all the Cars movies. Uh, I, I did all those. That one's what I would call, quote, easy. I don't have to do anything other than we had to buy a Focusrite Red Pre and a U87. We already have the U87. That they that Pixar demand that they wanted to focus right red. Um, normally, I use an Avalon, which is a uh, for for voiceovers, which is a two pre, but the, uh, the focus right's a solid state. And that's just what they wanted. It's very very subtle differences, but that's what they wanted. But for him, I would start recording and it just runs, and I send them the whole file. Right, and on the other end, they're on um, with via Zoom. Would have also connected via Source Connect, um, but their people are are on the other end directing him. So they obviously they record, or maybe not obviously, to you, but they record the voices first, and then they do the animation. So he would, they would, he'd have the script, and and they would say, you know, okay, Lightning's going to say, come on, Peter, get over here, and say whatever he's going to say. So the director would say that, and he'd do like three in a row of whatever his line was. And they'd say, okay, yeah, I can do it. And of course, it's, it, the way he does it is never like how it's printed, but that's how they want it. You know? There it's okay, because he's literally able to. Voiceovers, if you're doing a Nebraska Furniture Mart commercial, you read exactly what's on the, on the script. You don't get it. 
Yeah, yeah good question. Those, so those are really fun. Uh, it's fun to watch the movie and go, okay, they took that take. And I've still got them, so if you, if you come to the studio or whatever, I'll, I, I can pull them up. Uh, I, I can't send it out or anything, but you can sit there and you can listen to some of the tapes. It's cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, you said you went kind of, I don't know exactly how it happened, but you were doing the recordings for like, the school, like whatever, and then you went to the job for the uh, audio uh, engineering. How prepared for that were you really? Or did you kind how, of it? So how prepared was I for that? that uh, yeah. They had a tech job? Um, I knew the recordings. So you asked how, how prepared was I from going to, from recording school bands to getting a job at Editech, the, the post-production place. I, was, I wasn't as experienced in voiceovers and things like that. I mean, I, it was a really quick learning curve. But what I did is I just went in after hours and I just learned. Um, um, I also had the benefit of, of being able to watch Kurt before he left there. I was able to watch him a couple of weeks. So, yeah, I, you know, I just did. I, I jumped in. Had I not had that recording experience, so I no way. Uh, but thankfully, I had all that experience on the DAWs and, and doing all the editing and things like that. I had done, actually taken courses and, and, and things in red. So I knew how EQ and compression worked the right way. And that's a, that's a lifelong journey, too, just all that kind of stuff, too. But, so, yes, I had a good idea, but boy, there was, there was a really quick learning curve, especially with the software. I can't even, was it called Audio Vision, maybe? I can't even remember what it was, but um, it wouldn't say, it would save the edits, but it wouldn't, you couldn't put like plugins on. I remember that. You had to use the external, um, it was like a Yamaha with the, this Yamaha digital board, so you were going digital out of the, the, uh, the computer, and then uh, to the each each track, right? and then you put EQ or compression or things on on the Yamaha console, and then you'd have to save that on the board if you wanted uh, that saved with the session. Right? You couldn't just close the session and be up. All your plugins would come up later. No, they were all on the Yamaha. So if you didn't, and you brought that session up later, well, it's not mixed because that's all just the, the track. So yeah, it's a little bit different. Yeah. Uh, what microphones do you guys use? What mics at the at the studio? So I don't I don't switch hardly ever um, unless um, unless it's for ADR work. So we actually get a, a fair amount of ADR work. That's uh, automated dialogue replacement, right? Um, but for voiceovers, I leave the U87 up pretty much up just all the time. My, now, we, we don't have, my, uh, Kurt uses a um, 102, TLM 102, we only have the other one. He, he tend, Kurt tends to connect, and actually nowadays we connect with most of our talent. Not as much come in, it used to be where <coughs> voice talent, in my early days at, at Editech, you had ISDN technology, um, which dialed two 64-bit phone lines is how, so you could get 128. Um, but they, that's how you could connect to other studios, but that was expensive. Yeah. Um, but but now we don't. Kurt pretty much connects to most of his voice talent. I still have some come in from Omaha, but a lot of times we're connecting. But U eighty seven almost all the time. Now if we're doing ADR stuff, then they usually want a, a lav mic on and and a, a boom. So we use like a. a MKH, what is uh, the Sennheiser was a 50, I think is that what it is. Um, boom. I love microphones. I, um, since we don't do music and things, I used to experiment with microphones like back in your, you guys' age and when I was doing recording band, learning Saw Pro and recording bands, I, we, I love messing with microphones and things. I don't do it as much now. Um, just don't. 416, AKG 416 is fairly common too for us. <coughs> uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. What are some things that you, like, musician or the talent you hire that they do that makes you want to hire them? And what are some things that, like, people do that they don't want to hire them again? That's an awesome question, and, and just even just you asking that is a good, good thing, good thing to do. Um, uh, it used to be when, when before the Broadway shows is a, is a little bit different because I mean you gotta have 
you, you have to be a player. <laughs> you have to be a player to play those Broadway shows or um, any of that kind of stuff. So you can't just be a really good person and a pretty good player. You, you, gotta, you gotta be a player. But for me, it's, I hire good people first. I, I just like to be around good people. Um, I, I'd rather have, hire a good person that's, that's a really dang good, I mean, plenty enough to cut the job, um, maybe not world-class musician and a total asshole. <laughs> I, you know, it's like, I just, I, I, I just don't want to do that. So, that, that's a great question. But, you got to be prepared, basically, too. You, you just got to be prepared. Um, I guess it starts there. But just, just being a good person, even asking questions like that. If, you, if I hired you the first time, and, um, I, I would actually like you saying, uh, thing, asking me things like that, whatever it might be. Don't just come in and think, yeah, I got this job, nice. Uh, whatever. Because um, the, the cockiness is, just doesn't <laughs> go very, very far either. A little bit, a little bit does. Um, but I get to work with a guy named Kenny Holman. Um, you, you guys probably know um, Corey Wong, into that kind of stuff. That's kind of you guys' age. I wasn't even familiar with it. I hired uh, Kenny Holman from Minneapolis because I learned about him in, in the Horned Heads. And I mean, these guys are killer, killer world class the Horned Heads. They were Prince's uh, horn section. Uh, and I mean, Kenny is, look up Kenny Holman, K E N N I Holman. Um, and he's a, just a killer sax player, but he plays flute just as well as clarinet. So I've had shows where I uh, had, the, there was like a woodwind part for that, alto, flute, piccolo, clarinet, you know, all these crazy, and you had to play him like, like a world-class flute player and an alto. So I stumbled on Kenny and just happened to call him and say, hey, would you come down for the show? Now he and I are great friends, because I still hire him. He's going to come down for the Tina Turner show that's coming in, in the fall too. But so. Some people like him are both, and he is such a great guy. He stays at our house, and my kids love him, and he's, he's just awesome. Plus, he's just an amazing musician, too. But it starts with just, he's just such a great guy, too. So, but great question. Great question. Anyone else? Still got it. Mm -hmm. Wow. I got one. Yes. So, um, so this is the, uh, like, when you ask the doctors, what percentage of your time is music, and what percentage is, uh, administrative for professional doctors and they'll say on a good day 25 percent music 75 percent business ask your entrepreneurs that run a business startups they'll say on a good day i'll do 75 percent business 25 percent of what i really want to do and uh, so i was wondering what your percentage is <clears throat> so that's an excellent one and i can't stress enough now in where you guys are and i say guys I mean, gals, guys, people. <laughs> um, where you are now in your lives, you're not thinking about running a business and paying taxes on this or how, when you're going to send out checks for contracted musicians or um, how your rent's going to be paid on that business and the utilities and whatever, right? But, but someday you're going to have to, whether it's your own business or uh, just know that. And, and it's... It's all about learn, learning your scales right now too, but <laughs> the, the financial and business side, whether you're gonna be self-employed or not, but is a big part. So what percentage? Um, we've got it down to a pretty good science now with the studio. We use a, a program called Studio Suite, and so it's, it's got everything, our scheduling, invoicing, and everything in there. But it took a lot of setup to get all of our rates in there, because we've got, Remember, we book the voice talent. The voice talent gets paid on usage, how long it's going to run, what platforms, TV, radio, streaming, um, how many markets. So it's just going to be running Omaha, statewide, regionally, nationally. So we've got to have all these different rates, and then we've got to pay the voice talent. Well, we've got it down to a system now, but that's taken, that's taken time. We pay everybody with ACH, um, but it's, it's probably 25, right? 25% of our of my time at the studio. Again, now it's it's pretty pretty efficient. That studio suite's in the corner. And Sarah, you were there. You saw it. I just kind of do it while I'm doing the sessions. 
Um, I keep track of my time right there. Whether they use sound effects, whether they used any music, uh, keep on top of things. That's a that's a big one. Keep on top of it. Don't don't procrastinate. But that's a big one. Is just um, whether you're you're billing for whatever, but keep on top of things. Don't let it get behind. Uh, but it's still it's a it's a big part. We do all of our own stuff except for the year-end taxes. We send those out. We're an S corporation. So what an S corporation means is that we uh, start over at the end of the year. So you had your income and your expenses and you end up with uh, 200000 in profit, let's say, quote, profit. That goes 100000 to me and 100000 to Kurt that we have to pay taxes on. Whether we distribute that or not, now we do, we do distribute, so we're 50-50 and we just distribute profits with an S Corp. You also have to pay us a fair <coughs> salary so the government gets its um, Medi Medicare and Social Security and all that stuff. Right? And we have to do that too. Thankfully now there's Quicken payroll that handles that. You, just, you pay 80 bucks a month, and <laughs> but it handles it. So, but it, it's a big part. That, that side too. It's, it's not all fun to do, right? 